Right, welcome everybody. My great pleasure to introduce you to Tina. And uh, we're continuing with our CIO talk series today. My name is Jan Mentling. And uh, we are having different uh, people here in the audience that come from our bachelor's, from our master programs, and from our faculty. And some people uh, who work in practice. And maybe just to give Tina an impression of who's here. Uh, is there anybody who is studying the bachelors right now at VU? Please show your hands. All right. Is there anybody studying in the master's program here at this stage? Okay. Who is VU faculty? All right. And we have people who are working in industry or being from other universities. All right, I see some people overlap with these categories. That's interesting to see. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to have you here and introduce you to Tina. So she has been studying uh, with University of Zagreb in the economics faculty, and she has been also teaching finance there. Uh, and she found that it's actually a great challenge to expand on her professional um, experience. and. Um, Continued with uh, Zagrebačka Banka for quite a while in Zagreb. Um, and Zagreb, Zagrebška Banka, as pretty much as Bank Austria, belonged to the Unicredit Group. And uh, when there are various changes emerging here at Bank Austria, uh, some people must have thought it would be a good idea to have Tina over here. And maybe you can uh, develop your own experience today uh, that uh, they should actually be very happy to have her here. She will share her perspectives of what it takes uh, to approach uh, banking in these current and turbulent times. She will emphasize leadership, agility, and culture for innovation. I'm very happy to have you here. Floor is yours, Tina. Thank you. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe you should leave it for the end in case you like it. I mean. Uh, this is now giving me a bit of, um, yeah, expectations. What do you want uh, as of today's meeting? No, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. One of the points why, and um, it, it's coming from my past experience, uh, while working in the bank or starting to work in the bank, I was also the teaching assistant at the university. And this is what I found as a, my um, passion to do so. So I was trying to explore how to bring to, to students something what I didn't find that uh, very good how the professors were doing. And uh, at one point in time I had to stop due to work reasons. So being today here back at the university, I'm re really honored and um, very excited to do so. So for, for today, um, I would try at least to guide you through the agenda, just really in a brief point that you know with whom you are talking or what is my role basically when it comes to, to the bank and when it comes to um, UBIS. Then just briefly to understand how do I fit in my, in my work, where I would just give you a brief of a glance on the Bank Austria not selling anything, just to give you the framework. Then uh, what future brings for us who are exposed to the financial industry and basically how this financial industry is completely changing and making the turn. What are the boundaries between the industries? Do we know anymore what is the single boundary of the industry? What we as a single person working there or a future leaders that will be working there, what do you need to consider? What do you need to do? What do you need to learn? Or how you will guide your own teams in this kind of environment? And then how to fit into this kind of uh, future? Not knowing what future will bring, but for sure it will change dramatically. How to make yourself or your organization ready in order to fit into future like this? First of all, what is the role of the CIO? And here, it doesn't need to be the pure CIO as we were considering it in the past. And I will explain to you why. In this digital transformation, because nowadays, I mean, you know better than me because we are living this. Digital is everything. I don't know whether anybody of you is still using this uh, 
Vecca, meaning the watch that is ringing in the morning in order to get up. Anybody? Not even enthusiasts, vintage lovers, no? I mean, but uh, let's, let's put it very clearly, how long ago this was the machine, the tool, how you were getting up still in the morning, efficiently. Nowadays, I start panicking if I cannot find my phone, because there I am waking up. Fine, you start your there. Then uh, you check your agenda in the mobile phone. Then you go out and you pay something with your phone. Then you need to board on the um, airplane. You take your phone, you take the boarding card there. So it changed and it's not 50 years behind us that it changed. So what does it mean, a digital transformation? and how to put it in a frame of an environment that is changing like this, not taking years. What does it mean, agility, and how agility fits to agile? So this is also what I consider an, as one of the points that are very much relevant for the future. And the culture of innovation. And here is what I like very much, because usually when you say innovation, people think, okay, we need to invent something that will get us to Mars. So, innovation is not about this, or not only about this. How in the environment of a very disruptive industry, you take the innovation, how much of a challenge you put in front of yourself, saying, I need to think about uh, something innovative. What do I need to reach? What is my target when it comes to innovation? I want to be innovative. What does it take to be innovative, to be considered as innovative? So this is the agenda. Um, rules of engagement. Although the, it's written CIO talks, I wouldn't like that it's me talking, but CIO talk, which means also involving all of you. So if there is a question, Please raise your hand, we'll try to logistically support with the mic and uh, let's immediately take the question and then we, we turn it into a very interactive session. Is this fine with everybody? Good, thank you. The best way to start a presentation is with a joke. And um, Although I'm not the follower of the serious movie, however you want to call it, when you talk to the people in, working in branches, this is how people tend to see the first day in the month. We, working in the bank. You see a lot of people standing there. How many of you had the experience of queuing beginning of the month in a branch, whatever branch, not talking about the bank, whatever branch, any? Yeah, all of the others, I expect you are the ones doing everything online. Smart choice. <laughs> because the reality is this one, that still when it comes to environment, and by environment here I mean our customers, they love coming to the branch. Although they also complain, I mean, it's so long, we have to wait, but still they are attached to the physical presence of the branch. And this is something what, not only for this fact, you should take always into account. What is, your, what is the feeling of your customer? What is the perception of your customer? What is the trust? Do they trust online banking? If you ask my mom, she tends to say, there are a lot of bad things that are happening online. And I say, okay, my, name, name one bad thing that happened to your online banking. I was reading about this, malwares, I mean, how I can be sure. To some extent, she's right. She's fearing that her money can go into some other direction. So, the message here, whatever customer you will serve in the future, and there are different types of the customer that you need to take into account. 
look beyond what is their need. Because this is what you will be serving. You serve their need. But you need to take into account what is the bigger surrounding of their need. What is their age? What is their nationality? Are they framed with different type of culture? Do they have different type of expectations? Do they fear from something? Do they trust you? So these are certain points that we will for sure elaborate a bit more um, in, in the upcoming minutes. But one thing that don't fear that the digital transformation <laughs> will completely move us online. I will give you one example. Uh, some weeks ago, I was walking to work and there was uh, the Apple store. Huge queue outside. And in the morning, it was 6.30 approximately. So I take the walk in order to bring the adrenaline running. And you see people queuing and it was cold. And it was morning and it was fog. And I was thinking, my God, are they giving some gifts, presents? And then you read in the newspapers launching a new iPhone. They were willing to stand there and wait and not buying it online. So they want to be physically there. They want to touch. They want to feel the product. Be aware, and this is what we will talk about also. Is it now only about the product? Are the people buying iPhone or they are buying experience? Are they buying product, a phone, or they are buying a service? You get serviced in the Apple store very nicely. And there is a huge business case behind and there is a huge team working. For instance, a lot of dollars, I don't need to disclose, but a lot of time and teams, more than 30 people, were building up the box of the iPhone. I don't know, did you ever try to unlock, meaning bring the, the, the up? the upper part, it's a heavy activity and you try and you move and, and you know why? Because it's raising the tension. So I want to open up, I want to see my phone. Guys, it's this. They put 30 people building up a box in order to create a bit of, uh, I want to see. Don't underestimate the fact of what your customers like or why do they do and that going digital does not mean that you can now say I close all of my physical branches I close my stores and I put it online there is still a huge environment and a huge service that you can bring physical but you need to understand what do you do with the physical branch despite the industry Build something around us. Think beyond what is the pure physical existence. Okay? So, we still have physical branches where people seem to um, love to come. And we will continue having physical branches, but we need to look beyond. Ah, my role... <coughs> hmm. um, let's put it this words. I um, started last year in June in the middle of restructuring of Bank Austria. I don't know how much you were following the media. I think we were very well covered. Maybe not in the best uh, sense of this word, but we were covered. And um, basically at that time, I had to build up something different, knowing that the environment is changing and uh, doing it uh, old good fashioned way, maybe it's not the, the one that can support us for the future. Um, why I took this role, despite the fact that where I was working before, I had a very good position, managerial one, and when I said that I would like to go to Austria, they were telling me, you go in the middle of the hurricane. Are you nuts? And you will destroy your career. Here you're fine. 
you work, people perceive your quality, you have a good development path. And I was saying, yeah, you're right. So this is a safe, secure place. I know what steps I can take. But there, I mean, what if we can do something more? What if it will succeed? Nobody believes now that it can be that successful. What if I can be part of this? What if I can contribute to the successful future? This was the reason behind. I stepped into the roller coaster. Up to now, it's spinning, but it's very good because it's spinning in the right direction. Now, due to the fact that IT is also changing worldwide, we will touch this point later, um, with this year, as within Unicredit Group, we have also Unicredit Business Integrated Solutions, which is part of our company providing GBS, so global banking services, which means IT and operations among others. Due to the fact that it made sense to make this environment very close, the manager said, okay, it makes sense that the one person is the CIO in the bank as well as the CEO of the company who is giving the support, which I find very reasonable. So this means that in the portfolio of my responsibility, besides IT, demand management of IT, I have also process management and project management on the bank side, which I find very much fitting into what we want to achieve, keeping this under one reasonable umbrella. And this in total gives my portfolio of responsibility 1,500 people on both sides, which is a huge number. So you can imagine 30 people build up the experience of the iPhone. When 1,500, I believe I can do much more. Okay. Bank. Austria, at a glance. I don't know how much you are exposed, how much you are interested, but these are certain facts and figures which for itself I would like just to give you the point of what is my area of focus. So just because of this. When it comes to this point, cost income ratio, 67.2%. Looking at 2015, I think it was more than 83. So, and this is the point that uh, if you compare, for instance, with uh, banks in Japan and China, they have a cost income ratio of 32, 33%. So when I saw this, I said, I mean, we are doing something wrong. And it's not that they are not generating revenues, they are. And they're heavily investing. But they have some magic of balancing this and keeping it on the very efficient point, which I believe whoever will work in, in financial industry, you have to keep an eye on this. It's a strong KPI. But it's giving you the direction where you should work on. This is where IT steps in because we are investing heavily in IT. 35 million euro we invested into smart banking solutions in 2015. 35 million, it's not peanuts. And while you are investing, you need to keep uh, your cost income ratio going down. So it's not an easy job. How to make out of the 35 million euro invested, some revenues, while you know that the competition is on your back. How do you make the revenues out of this, knowing that the customer experience and expectations are changing? So you cannot satisfy them in the same way as you were doing before. Due to that fact, we changed also the service model which meant we don't need to be that much present physically with the branches, but we need to do more when it comes to digital. 
We need to do more when it comes to online banking, when it comes to mobile banking, when it comes to self-service devices in our branches. Okay, so let's give people more opportunity to do some digital work, but it doesn't happen overnight. I don't know whether you, you tried to convince somebody to change their way and their approach in how do they do certain activities. So not that easy. Then what I still call an innovation because it was applying available yet simple solution which uh, can gain a positive customer value and we did not build it up, we tried to find a way how to embed it in our business model. I don't know whether you found uh, at least the last couple of months uh, Dominic team and the photo payment. This is, and this is what I will still continue calling innovation. We changed the approach on how we are doing stuff and we changed fast. So you don't need to go to the self-service device and to scan, for instance, your invoice. You take your phone, you take a piece of paper, it doesn't need to be standardized, and the smart IT behind, recognize the field, fill it in, done. And Dominic team then is doing a good job also for us, giving a bit of a marketing strategy. This is what I call innovation. And uh, I'm very proud that we made it happen and roll it out in a very short time frame. Other information, for instance, this information on, on uh, the market share, I think it's relevant just to give a comparison on how difficult it is to succeed. While you are having, for instance, to almost 29% of the market share, like Unicredit has in Croatia, it's easier to maintain your good results because you have a very big portion of the customers. While, for instance, if you take our share in Austria, I still think it's remarkable, but it's showing how difficult it is to operate, how also competitors are very strong and how you need to be very adaptive to what is happening. Enough about this. Let's talk about what uh, future brings when it comes to financial industry. Um, how many of you are either working or being exposed in a sense of, I want to go in the direction of the financial industry, whereas I think banking, insurances, how many of you? Okay, still, vast majority. Why? What are the reasons of your choice going for banking or going for insurances? But the honest one, please, because it will bring us to the further discussion. Any? Yeah? It's an international industry and allows you to work in Vienna without knowing German. Me as well. <laughs> so, international possibilities. Okay. Others? Are you sure? <laughs> okay, but I will elaborate why. Every day in the morning when I get up, I think today is a new day, whereas we need to find a way how to make banking. Because I'm not sure that we are very safe. I'm not sure. Others? Huh? So to, to give yourself an opportunity to work in different areas. Okay, okay. Some other examples? Yeah. Okay, so how to transform? How to participate in the transformation? Okay. Let me say one experience. Um, I was um, in love with pharmaceuticals while I was um, in the high school. 
Really? <laughs> Sounds funny. <laughs> yeah. How chemistry is supporting humanity? Then I found some different aspects, which not all of them I consider that are supporting humanity, but it's a personal opinion. Nevertheless, I was preparing for almost two years to go to the university in order to study chemistry and in order to be closer to this industry. One week before the, the, the exams, I was thinking, Phew, and it's changing the environment so fast, will I be able to have a job? I'm not sure. So one week before, I decided I will apply for the University of Economics, which is a completely different environment from chemistry, physics, biology, whatever. It was a brave move. Um, I mastered the finance because I was very much interested in the financing industry. And at uh, that moment, when I finalized my master's thesis in the environment or at the market, it was very hard to get the job because banks were already plenty of economists. And there was an open um, posting for IT and everybody was talking about T IT. Everybody was talking about programming and if you want to work in uh, IT programming, there is a work for you. So I give it a shot. I got to the interview and um, they were asking me some questions and I said, I will be very honest. I have no clue about programming. I never ever put a single line of code. And they said, and they were very much vision, visionary at that moment, the managers there, they said, yeah, but we also need business person. So somebody who understands banking from a different perspective who will help us being closer to business because we are experts in IT, in software programming. But when it comes to finding a common point with the business, we have a very hard time. So if you are willing to learn, we take you for the job. Then the panic started. So I have to program something for God's sake. But I learned. It took me three months for the first programming languages. What I did not manage, I mean, despite 20 years of tradition of Java, I did not get to, to, this, um, to this level. But I was for four years a programmer. The one who understood the business, this is what they liked. And this is what I think we should all, whoever is working in any kind of IT related industry, stop thinking about IT as a pure technology. Because you will not make it with uh, what is coming. And I will tell you why. What future brings? So, you said, I think it's a safe, banking is a safe business. I was, um, mm, last couple of days, uh, in, in one symposium that gathers all CIOs cross world, and we were all equally concerned. And we were concerned because we were discussing about what Amazon, for instance, is doing. I know, you heard about Amazon 10,000 times. But uh, not only because of what it does for the payments, then we were, for, for banking payments, then we were discussing about Alibaba. They're doing asset management. I mean, get out of our business, we are bank, we do asset management, they're doing lending. This is banking business. So, is it that the financing industry is still the same? And who is participant of the financing industry? Can you say? I mean, let's see. Talking about financing industry, are we able to say what are the boundaries when we say this is financing, this is insurance, this is others? Do you, do you see very clear boundaries? Not really. 
Even taking a simple example, for instance, when it comes to the bank, you can get your mortgage loan and you get also credit protect insurance. So because you're not buying only mortgage, you want to be safe in case you lose your job, in case you have, have some health issues. So that there is insurance over your, your mortgage in order to support you. So this is your need. What is the boundary between insurance and the bank? Because we give you the loan and insurance. We sell you insurance. Hmm. Then even if you go beyond what we will see some examples, it's becoming more and more blur the boundaries between different industries. And we are stepping into different areas which are not defined by the single industry itself. And this is where I fear for banking as we know it now. If we don't take disruptive decisions and make disruptive proposals to the market, somebody else will do. Somebody else will enter into banking as we know it today. Why here it's very important to remember from product to service? When you, for instance, you buy a car, you go to the car producer, manufacturer, and uh, they tell you, okay, you have your car, I would propose you also the insurance, and uh, I will propose you also that you pay up front certain um, possibility to have a regular technical check of your car, and if you wish, I give you also a loan. Sorry, banking. But me as a customer, I like the fact I go, I take the car, I get insurance, it's fine. I get the loan funding for this if I don't have the money. So with one shot, you took it all. This is what customers are looking for. So you cannot anymore in the industries that are operating heavily in this way, go solely with the product approach. Because product approach is not anymore there. Products are now spread across different industries. I cannot say landing is only banking product. Because car manufacturers give the loan. Alibaba gives the loan. Product is now spread across industries. Therefore, we are talking about services. And what we should keep in mind, whatever we are doing, whatever we would like to change, we should keep in mind that we should build up a service and the experience with us. So whenever we are in a contact with a customer, bear in mind that this is the experience you are building and that we are not anymore selling a product because product does not belong to the single industry anymore. And then there are certain questions that will pop up. And then how do we define a product? What is a product? Now, in the future, how we can say what is a product and how it goes in our product catalog. We are very traditionalist. We say, this is product catalog, this is the price. And then we have packages and when you say, yeah, but if you bundle, then you get certain discount. This is the, the question we need to keep in mind, how we are going to design our products. Do you feel that the financing industry is still a safe place to be? I would rather say it's going very transformational, very much. The question that I see here is, uh, what is the time that will take us to be there at that point? That banking will lose its attributes that it has today. A place where you go for a loan. A place where you go to open up an account. What if we lose this? And I'm talking about banking, but you can take insurances. You can take car industry. What will happen if we lose what is today defining our work? 
Then we will talk about robots and artificial intelligence, what we, we humans, can lose with this. But let's wait. How this product that we are still selling, but we are not sure in which industry it is, how it will coexist in the supply chain. Nowadays, you go to a big supermarket and you find everything there. You want to buy a TV, it's there. You want to buy a coffee, grocery, you want to buy flowers, it's there. Time to time I get annoyed because if I need to go to a co for a coffee, it's on the other way, so it's huge. But then you move online, you order and it's delivered, you don't waste time. These are the choices. And this is the trade-off that we need to be ready to embrace because we bundled a lot. We want to give, not the product, we give you a service. You come here, one-stop shop, you take everything. But what is the critical point when, you, when the customer starts saying, I had enough. I don't want to go in a bank when they offer me a TV and a watch and, uh, because I wanted to do banking. Will we be able to find a moment where we move them to online, to any kind of digital channel, and say, OK, you don't want to be there, fine. There are customers who like that we bundle everything, that we sell them full service, go. Online banking, go mobile banking. Go on our websites, do whatever you, you want. But we need to give them the opportunity to do. Then, as the boundaries are getting very blurred, who will sell what we define a product? Do we want that, for example, out of the brain, we create a loan and um, credit protect insurance and we open up an account and whatever and we give it to somebody else to sell it for us. Because we find it too expensive, we don't have that many branches, so somebody else can sell for us. Are we ready to rethink where our sales points will happen? And if the others are already taking our product, how do we cope with not existing boundaries of the industries anymore? This is what concerns me in the morning. There are a lot of companies stepping into my industry. So what do I do? How do I find a disruptive idea or how do I find a way to change where we are now to improve, knowing that is not happening overnight? What we all love and what is needed is the data, right? In God we trust, but all others must bring data. So, how do we collect if we say, okay, somebody else is selling our loan? How do we have the touch of who is the customer there? What do we learn if somebody else is selling and collecting the data? Or if the product doesn't exist in our ownership anymore, how do we collect the, the feedback? How do we build up our analysis further on? How do we improve if our data are somewhere? We don't know. And we don't know if we can trust the ones to whom we give this nice idea. Here, what I would like to touch just a bit afterwards is the blockchain. I don't know how much you already heard or you already investigated, did the research. By the way, this picture on the left, it should show how do you stand on your boundaries. Do you go out? Hmm. Regulatory framework when it comes to financial industry, well, give it a shot, but uh, I can grant you that it's not a successful one. Do you stay within your boundaries and you praise God and you keep your fingers crossing Okay, if I will be very good, maybe somebody else will not take my job. Is it feasible? Not really. But if you try to reach out, standing within, but you still find ways to reach out, are we able to find something beyond? This guy, whose only leg you see here, he is um, 
by the way, the one who is participating to the marathon in New York, and he is blind. And uh, this is what technology can do for you. One startup in UK made a, a clothes. I think the startup is Wearworks. Cool. They made clothes that can navigate blind people. Now, this was the outreach for somebody. So you stayed in the boundaries of clothing, reproduced clothes. But you put something what made completely different world, a different future for somebody who is blind and who is now participating to the marathon of New York. Okay? We don't, I mean, we don't need to strive maybe for this level of innovation, and it doesn't happen that every day you will find something which is a breakthrough. But consider that you don't need to stand in your boundaries all the time and saying, regulators are killing me so I cannot move left, not right, no. Try to find a way, try to do the outreach, stand within the boundaries. You don't know what you can find just on this side. Hmm. Um, I will try to put the video just for setting certain topic. Let's see. Hope it can work. Maybe you already saw it because it's not a new one. Did you? There is a person sitting, but just for. And this is Tesla car. So I will try to move. Do you see what is happening? There is, no, it doesn't need the sound, but do you see there is no interaction of the driver with the car. So not touching anything. Watch now. Okay. Stopping. Driving. Okay, the curve. Stop. Okay, works good. Still, works good. There is a sign, you have to stop. Following still the rules. What do you f find? And I mean, on the right side, you find how the car is interacting with the environment, not the driver, car is interacting. Uh-oh. Some people, I have to bit slow down. It's a car. It's not the person who stopped the car or who slowed down. Still, no interaction. I mean, the driver is sitting there, not touching anything. And this is the speed of processing the data from the environment that the car does. If technology can bring us this far, and it's a reality, I mean, it's not the science fiction, is there, the car is there. Would you take the ride? Hmm? Others? Guys? Brave. Would you take the ride with the car? I did. You did. And? On A2, it's 130, it's working fine. On A2? Yeah, it's working also here. Yeah. In the city? You tried. You were not... Um... I was not pressured. Well, I was not pressured. <laughs> this is what they, I mean, they test, I hope. <laughs> So you fear driving with this car. So it's not you driving the car. Car driving you. Interacting with the environment. Look, finding people. Oh, no, place to park. Did you try to park somewhere in the city center? Nice adventure. This time, 
you relax, car checks where you can park, you step out, you leave. I mean, car will do its own. You don't need to be there. Okay, how do you find this experience? Disturbing. Hmm? Disturbing. Yeah. Just imagine that there was a truck coming when those two girls were running. Do you think that the car will not spot? No, just the, if the driver can be hurt and those two girls, and you can avoid that by hurting those two girls, what would the, the car the choose? Do? What would the car do when it comes to human decisions? And we take this as a human decision on when we need to take the risk. Which risk do we take? Do you think that it's not possible to program it? Saying, if you find, so if, then else, simple loop. Saying, I'm joking. Saying, if you find uh, interruption at the road which you assess as a human and in parallel you are processing a truck don't hurt human in theory if everything what we saw is possible to build up <laughs> this can be taken into account who is making the decision and what I found very human like is when you said I will not, or I would not feel comfortable driving in that car. Why you would not feel comfortable? Because you don't drive, so you don't control. You don't have the control. Here, I agree fully with you. There are certain decisions. Question is if you can delegate it to somebody else. And I was just sharing with Jan before. One example of trust. And this is the trust. We don't trust that the car can drive on its own. We should be in control. Now, a colleague bought Alexa. You know, what is Alexa? Okay, and she has a three-year-old kid. She wanted to do an experiment. So she put Alexa and explained to her child, this is Alexa, not saying it's a robot, it's artificial intelligence behind nothing. This is Alexa. Okay, and uh, the lady said, hi, Alexa, my name is... Okay, simple question, answer, hi. Third day more or less. Alexa was in the kitchen while they were having a breakfast and the small child was, she's a three-year-old, coming down and to the breakfast and saying, good morning, Alexa. So Alexa was after the third day part of the existence. Three days. The week after, when they were getting ready for the kindergarten, the little lady was standing in front of Alexa, showing two combinations to wear. Alexa, should I take the pink one or the leopard one? She was aware and already adopted the fact that Alexa can assess. She, three-year-old, delegated her decision. It's a simple one, but she, delegated her decision to a machine. Now, what I want to say with this, this is the speed of adoption. In adoption, the little lady adapted to the fact that Alexa is there, not questioning what is. Is it human, machine, artificial intelligence, whatever. What if... Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry, Chief. 
because you, you were obviously speaking about different generations. You were speaking of the old child, and you were speaking about the parent. So um, I would like to pick that up. And my question is, you were talking about technology as changing the world or not. But what about customer demographics? So you as a bank, what is your customer structure? Um, I, I want to refer to the, and you know all about that, but to the generation theory of Strauss and how. So you as a bank, can you tell us, you can tell us about your customers and the preferences of mm -hmm. customers, but how does the customer demo look like? Because the three-year-old kid won't go to you and say, or oh, use your tools, your smart packing to get a loan. But it will become your customer, or you will want to become your customer with the age of 16. What do you offer to those customers? This is just one example when it comes to millennials. And here, I think it's a huge hype over millennials. We want them as customers. And they're not loyal. How do you keep them? So we look for, for a generation which is not easy to get as a customer. And we do all nice brainstorming sessions on how to keep a young person, what to offer to a young person. In reality, 40% of millennials, what we call millennials, are broke every second month. The customers, I mean, it's a reality. I was the one working some student works. One month is fine, the other month when you don't find the money, <laughs> In reality, with whom you can explore the value are elderly people or the ones who are mature, who have their salaries, who want a new flat, who want to refurbish, who want to buy a car, who want to invest their money because they were saving for a long time. This is where you want to go. This is where, I mean, quite honestly, we don't need to fool each other. This is where the money is. So if you want to offer some funding, you, you offer it to mature people. <coughs> but do we think that we are far from the fact that even elderly person will ask, ask Alexa, I'm not sure, should I invest in this fund or that fund? Can you check? Are, are we sure that we are far from the fact that somebody will ask a machine for an opinion or at least to test this? one point and then I will come back to you. The second point, what I think is a good example of disruption and I find it a disruption. Um, I was talking lately with um, uh, a CIO from BBVA Bank, which is a pretty big one and they also want to, to acquire millennials and how do we keep. And what I found um, talking to him, I mean he is by the way um, almost blind, so a couple of percentage still he can see. And by his uh, physical condition, he was trying to explore the ways on how you can operate with the mobile banking app, but not seeing properly. So do we want maybe to reconsider that our customer base is the elderly one? And you have a very small buttons where, I mean, time to time, I also try to adjust. How elderly people who don't see very well, or where the, the numbers are small, or the letters are slow, small, how, how do they find the experience with the fact that we want to move them to some nice online digital experience? And then it's a question, do they pick a physical interaction due to the fact that they are not comfortable with the digital transformation. Not seeing that maybe they will also delegate their decision to machine. I don't know whether I answered. Just uh, to be quite frank, so do you think, if you can, could talk about the custom, uh, customer acceptance, are they accepting it or not accepting it? Or can you say anything about that? They're based on the... Yeah. We don't really spoke with the BBVA, but if you take Barclays, for example. Barclays are looking into robot advice because it's, it's very expensive to 
uh, engage people to employ people to offer financial advice. Mm -hmm. So they are using robo advice because it's cheaper, but no one. The, the question is: Is the market going to accept that or not? Maybe you could shed your your, your your brain on that. Right? For sure, certain points are related to uh, market. Certain points are related to the culture and the customer itself. Now, one thing can be we are facing the fact that the customers, our customer base is the older one. And the, the acceptance rate of innovation and changes is lower. They're not that willing to every month to accept something new you are offering. Now go mobile, now go online, now you have a robo-advisor. But they're not willing. It's a fact. Are we able to do something to help them to accept? Are we able to do certain actions to support our customer migration? Because as the technology is moving very fast, are we in a position to pile up additional people to serve? our customers. Question mark is to which extent, what is the profitable anymore? We are, all of us, we are not working for, for a charity business, we are working for revenues. And question mark is what is the profitability that you are striving for? Still, you have to make your customer satisfied. But can you support them that this is easier customer experience? That you teach and train them? Can you create the communities for people who want to explore more financial services? You install a person, myself, in the late uh, evening hours, and they teach customers who want to come free of charge, and we explain to you, and you cover 100 customers or potential customers, advising them on how to do. You teach them what to do and how. It's not a silver bullet. For some percentage, it may work. For some other, it will not. But the message with Alexa is uh, that um, the, the, the three-year-old will be an, ad an adult and will be ready to adopt and adapt based on her experience faster than we are now. This is the point. Okay. But I'm often a friend in this case of the automotive business. Um and just to uh to the video, um Google just announced one week ago that they start with the light cleaning, um automated driving in um, Arizona. And there is not even a driver in the driver's seat and the cars are moving around. Um and the customer acceptance is very high because they see that the first adopters um, um, gain trust and they see nothing happen. It's basically more safe and safer than the person who drive. Um, and um, I guess it's only just a question of time um, which will take broader customer uh, service to the new technologies. Only the first adopters are with children young generations, millennials, um, and if the elder people see, okay, they adopted, they trusted, and it works, they also get a new service. It just takes a long time for them, but the children are... Let me just maybe take now the point um, of showing something, what I consider as a innovation hype, but, but it can be adoption hype as well. So, for example, Okay, can be a good point. This is the time. This is expectations. How the hypes work. Then, this is usual. Usual. But there is a point where you can land very hard with hypes. Yet, it goes back just with a slower pace. And on the timeline scale, it takes more time. Here it's new. 
Everybody's excited. Wow, I want to have it. I don't know what it is, but I want to have it. And you move here. Wow, I don't know what it can bring. Maybe some millions of revenues are there. Then you start exploring more and you say, wow, we are a legacy bank. So how we can do, phew, it will cost us a lot of money. And then we are not sure how fast the customers will adapt. And then at the end, when the technology is mature enough, and when it's not on the hype, being expensive, not explored fully, here, do the customers know? No, because we don't know. We are looking at, but we don't know. We are sitting on the top of the roller coaster, saying, wow, if we move down, we don't know whether we go really down or we go up. And here, the customers will start accepting, but it will take time. I think what we discussed about Alexa, somewhere here, like most of the game changers, when it comes to certain innovation and disruption, they start here. Then you get the cold shower saying, it takes money to invest. It takes time. And then I'm not sure if the customers, my customers will accept this. It takes time. But the question mark is, when do you need to start preparing yourself? If you start preparing yourself here, guess what? There will be minimum 10 companies who will offer the same. They were maybe preparing themselves already here. So question mark is when you jump on the roller coaster, do you jump here and you hope, hope that it will not cost you huge investment and you hope and believe that the customers will adopt with, with time. Here, we are always talking about early adopters, also when it comes to, to industries. Question mark is just if you position yourself longer in the time, are you still in the game? Moving forward. I don't want to, to elaborate on this because most probably you heard too many times. But in order to reconsider what do we do? Do we need to own something in order to be successful? Uber doesn't own any single car. They did not invest in any single car. And invest means cost, not success. Platform, people apply, you drive. I don't know how is your acceptance with Uber. I love it. You have a look, is it somewhere here? Yeah, okay, you look the rating, fine. You already know the price, so no surprises. Perfect, I take, I go. It didn't take long for them to jump in. Now, there is a question on the boundaries because they did a bit like this when it comes to regulation. Question mark is how it will end up. Question. But let me put a very simple exercise, which we can physically also do. Unlock your phone. Unlock. Give it to the person next to you. Unlocked. And the person can do whatever he or she wants with your phone. Huh? Do you do? Do you do? <laughs> The person, the person to whom I gave my phone, 
was doing the WhatsApp to the first contact that uh, I had. Texting, message. So I, I was late, and I was keeping her phone, and I was like very polite, opening a browser, waiting when she will return my phone back, and I was looking to you too. I mean, I'm polite. I don't, I don't uh, check on what do you have there. Are we willing? to share a lot? What is the, the, the boundary when we say, nah, I don't trust? Trust? Do we remember trust? Do we trust the car driving for us? I, I gave my phone, honestly, as my experience, just because I had a chance to look at what she's doing. And I was not feeling comfortable. Airbnb, they don't own a single apartment. And do you know why it's called air? Because the first offer that they made was the aired mattress. You know, the one that you use on the beach, but maybe a bit bigger one. It was what they offered the first time. They don't own a single apartment. What the uh, tourist industry will say to this? What hotels will say to this? How they will cope with this kind of disruption? Amazon, earning from the groceries more than the grocery store. Earning on the clothing in the amount which counts to six companies, the biggest one on clothing. And you know what uh, was the, the discussion at the very beginning? What was the, I don't know, to some extent challenging towards Amazon? They were asking them, how do you think that anybody will buy clothes without trying it? So people go to, to the stores and they try their clothes before they buy. They want to be sure that it's fitting. And it was a matter of trust because we did not trust that what we buy online will fit us. So we want to have a look, we want to try whether it is. Six times or revenues in the amount of six biggest clothing providers. This is what makes me concerned in the morning having a coffee. Is there somebody there thinking about which kind of service it can provide to my customer, which I will maybe not be aware of, where they start to enter into my industry heavier than I ever thought before? When it will happen, will I see Will I understand the signs? I mean, look at those examples. Uber, who has anticipated coming? Airbnb, did the hotels anticipate it coming? Did um, Zara, Asos, did they know that they will compete with Amazon? With the drones delivering your stuff? Now what they're discussing, whether they make a smart drone certification and you allow, allow a drone to enter your house without you being there. You sign certain kind of certification key and the drone unlocks your house, gets in, drops the package, leaves. I'm putting on the table. Question. the regulator always tries to, especially in Austria, they are always saying, yeah, this is not possible, you have to double check, and it's quite hard to introduce something like that. I fully agree with you. What I was saying on Uber, they saw the boundary, but they leaned, still. They reached something. The outcome on potential penalties is unknown. 
It can be huge. It can be peanuts. Are they willing to take the risk? Yes, they were. They were taking the risk that maybe regulators will be coming and saying, mm -mm, not exactly. But, but the fines, especially the financial industry, they increased uh, in, in the last years. And uh, so. I, I had on this point, I had um, an opportunity to, or we were trying to, to have an opportunity to discuss with some experts on the grounds when it comes to, you, you can talk to professors, you can talk to some experts. And uh, time to time what I found that we in the industry were trying to be bigger Catholic than the Pope. And we say in order not to take the risk. And this is the power of the stick. You get fined once, maybe, and you are not willing to take the risk anymore. But there are companies who are taking the risk and they are entering into your environment. But this is nothing that the client is willing to pay, to be honest. This is something we have to do. Exactly. What is the trade off if you don't pay? So let's take an example. You introduce something, you get fined. Solution B you don't do anything. The customer is served completely by somebody else. You lose your business. I don't have an answer, really, honestly. There are opportunities that seemingly there are companies exploring. I don't have an answer on whether we can do it or not. I think we should consider, is it possible and under which conditions? We need to go and chase under conditions where it is possible. This is where we can do something. Why not giving this stuff to the to other company, like everything that's heavy for us to do and has nothing to do with land directly? <coughs> to give it to somebody else, they can do it. It's a new business, they can start it. We are an ecosystem. <laughs> yeah. It can be always done. Yep. We are talking about the ways that different industries are outreaching and going, let's say, staying within the boundaries, but doing something more. And I'm not sure I understand the motive, the outreach of the financial industry itself and the bank outreach for that matter. For instance, you say that certain financial or regulatory driven explanations, and the regulators give you guidelines you interpret this in a way that you know, with the expertise that you have, and you always, human, you always take into account experience from the past. I was fined or I was threatened to be fined. I will put even more protection. Now, is there a way how to explore to still do it in a legally manner in the way that you are still fitting to regulation? I believe so. Okay, but my question was actually uh, a bit more specific. I would like to know what is the Bank of Austria doing in order to, um, let's say... May I uh, immediately... ...towards these disruptive new technologies and what is the outreach of this industry itself? Is there an outreach of this industry? I can immediately answer to you. First of all, I cannot disclose certain information. <laughs> no, unfortunately, despite the discussion that I would like to take the message here, no silver bullet, no single solution that we take from Bank Austria, we give to Raiffeisen. Guys, it's working, do it. We give it to Erste, we say it's tried, it's working, do it. But there is a way to explore under which conditions. Because once you get framed and you have a single part of the customers which are sitting, you don't go left, you don't go right. And you have the pile of the customers with whom you are working. So how do you do business more? And these are the targets. Every year you need to do more. There is no magic way how to do it 
without reconsidering, you question yourself even on the facts that you, you thought that are God-given and there is no way to do it. Mm, I would say that Bank Austria, as well as the majority of the banks, are waiting. Me, personally, not willing to step on the roller coaster. Because up to now, what you can observe, it costs you a lot of money. It costs you a lot of invested time, and you are not quite sure on the outcome. Technologies are still immature, and due to immaturity, they cost a bit more. Now, the beauty, as we discussed, is when to step in. And therefore, we, in our duty, and I find as my duty, is to very much observe on the market what are technologies, what are providers, what are regulators saying. Because I can get on the train, I can invest, I, I put the time, I put the money, and then the regulators say, when they are mature enough also to understand, no, no, not allowed. So the right moment when it comes to banking is the key. And we are not uh, tech providers. We are the ones who are providing service to the customer, which is based on what you find on the technology environment. The hype is now at the very beginning. A lot. I am not sure how to prioritize. <laughs> Um, I, I think what, what we have to be aware, and there is one example, I mean, we are an ecosystem. Um, now, we can do on our own or we can embed certain things. And um, the question around this is how to do it in the smart way. I think what you should consider if you are very much into IT, there are 256, I think, programming languages. So if you are really much into programming languages and you pick up two, are you competitive on the market? Will be people searching for your skills? You are competing with a lot of other competitors. So you find that those are the ones you cannot specialize for everything and the environment is changing very fast, technology is changing very fast, that you can do everything. But observing and picking the right and saying, yeah, this is the one that is now mature, this is fitting my needs, this is customer oriented, it's easy to integrate, it's easy to connect, it will bring me the value, this I take. I am a CIO. I cannot agree. <laughs> I'd like to build on this point actually because one of the biggest uh, criticisms or kind of challenges of the banking system and it also applies to other very regulated or kind of also older industries. Uh, the banking industry is, is completely riddled with legacy systems. Uh, a big part of digital transformation has to do with data management. Mm -hmm. How do you 
Yeah, how, I mean, how is this playing into the digital strategy of the bank? Like, you need to update the data management, you need to, I don't know, update legacy systems. Legacy systems, um, I don't think it can be updated. Sure, replaced. Yeah, no, 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 still not. No, <laughs> no, I, I would not go in this direction and because there is a better way to do it. You have your legacy systems, you have the, the infrastructure, you have the applications that you built there. What is the new world bringing is, for example, digital open platform, which are also called hybrid integration platforms, which sit over your legacy system. Sit over and eventually replace, no? Question mark is whether you can completely shut down and say it's not needed anymore. But what you can do, you overcome the hurdle of the legacy, and this is what uh, the, the tradition, so when you are a traditional bank, you have the hurdle of the legacy. And in order not to start the journey that is for sure minimum five years journey, minimum on the changing of the legacy, there is a smarter solution. It's probably also cheaper to put the platform that can also give you some other opportunities to integrate and to give. You open up your hybrid digital platform for other participants to come here and you charge. that you work in, the how, does, how do you as a CEO are, like with some, part, with some specific examples of the bank of Austria? Mm -hmm. um, what I can tell you, for instance, is that when it comes to digital transformation, if you have the customers who are made majority 50 years plus, and you think about the digital transformation, you think, Phew, but my customers are 50 year olds, so what still I can do in order to fulfill the needs of the young ones? What, for, what has to be embedded, first of all, and this is what is, is also part of the cultural, you know, culture of innovation. What it means is, first of all, you cannot put the silver bullet and write a memorandum saying, now everybody starts behaving in this way. You think in digitizing our processes, simplifying what we have, putting some additional technology, doesn't work. You now start thinking that we migrate everything from branches to, to digital because it's a digital transformation. It also doesn't work. So what the first step always is when it comes to digital transformation is start with small transformation teams start training them to think in a different way. And there is no book that you can read that will tell you, now you need to reshape your organization, now you need to put 10 million euro, now you need to buy a FinTech, now you need to put a additional digital channel. You start with your own team because this is the most valuable knowledge that you usually have in the, in the bank and you start with the smaller ones. You cannot digitalize 5,000 people. And I'm saying digitalize because they are the ones who are driving the transformation. You need to start thinking in a different way. And start thinking in a different way, building them a different type of talents, building them a different type of trainings, building different types of not skills, competencies. Because before, when you were hiring a person, you hire a person who is a COBOL manager, a COBOL programmer. And the ones who are COBOL programmers are not needed anymore. <coughs> so now you, start to ha you, you need to have also a different hiring process. When you hire a person, you don't look for specific skill. You look for a competency. Is this a person who is bringing me diversity in thinking. Is this a person that has a different type of experience? Why somebody 
who is an expert in chemistry cannot maybe support your team in building something different. Another question which is part of this one, that do you consider digital transformation only for the part of the business of the bank that's facing the customers? I mean, do you have, do you consider digital transformation maybe for some of the internal processes that the bank is having and for its operations? And what do you do in terms of this? In that, in that when it comes to um, changing the processes, this is where I'm personally focused on and this is why I think it's a very much valuable skill that you can have. Working on end-to-end -end activity, whereas first of all you put a lot of business related knowledge in the process management because you look from A to B spot how it's performed. Then you analyze what are the ones that are not performed in the right way. Either the not the way how you designed it or it can be replaced with some other approach. You insert a technical solution. You don't print the paper, but you make um, mobile TAN in order to confirm. You don't print and sign the paper, but you put the TAN and you certificate with the TAN. So these are, when it comes to process management, and this is what I think, that when it comes to digital transformation in banking is something that can for sure support all of your core commercial activities. Just before we continue, I know that we are most probably completely breaching the time that was offered. Um, what I can propose as um, for the ones who are not um, anymore able to, to participate due to the timing, are free <laughs> to, to leave us. For the ones that still would like to, to remain here, um, we don't need to run through the presentation. Instead, what we can do, we do the question and answer session now, and you put all of your questions based on what we also discussed before on this. I don't know whether you agree with the proposal. Do we need a break? No? Yes? Jan? Maybe I grab the mic, then I can use this opportunity to broaden and open up uh, the discussion on this. But maybe um, you can throw in maybe quickly uh, those three key capabilities that you observe uh, as um, the most important ingredients uh, to shape your role as a CIO. I know that it was still on your list, and maybe you can briefly share this with us as well. On how it's impacting your journey, what I found as a very, very important point on the transformation, because you cannot say I'm starting from here and then I forget everything that is impacting me outside. And knowing that you cannot build up all the skills inside your company that are needed, not all the competencies that are needed in order to adapt, what you need to find is a way how to bring your organization to this point. And this is why I was saying that the culture and the agility of the organization is something what is important in order to drive digital leadership. And digital leadership being the overall umbrella over the activities that you are doing. Why CIO is not anymore a technology expert? These are just some of the examples. CIO currently, and this is why every one of us have to reconsider how much it is now becoming a business role, where you are, according to the, to the research, 24% of the old CIOs are responsible for enterprise change. So we are not talking anymore about IT as such. We are talking about that IT is so embedded into every single area of the business that you need to consider that it's CIO responsibility to transform the enterprise. And this is why you have to be business skilled, searching for customer value, not only for technology, not only, yes, it is important, you have to have an eye on the vendors, 
most probably, on the fintechs that are fitting your role as a responsible for innovation of different types. This is why you have to have technology and solution experts, not yourself in the company. You build up those type of skills, the ones who are able to look for some specific technological provider for some fintechs that are supporting your business model. What we discussed before a bit is related to data analytics and data scientists nowadays. There is a huge demand for data scientists because 46%, according to the research of the CIOs, are also responsible for the data management. And the vast majority of the value of what you can frame for the future is lying with data. So how much you have to search for the competences on the data scientist. So you are changing to some extent your either hiring needs, so if you are taking people from outside, or you are building this from the inside. This is, for instance, what we started. In order not to hire from the outside and start from scratch, because what you rely on is also the experience of the people who are with you. And you can support them being an expert on other fields, growing certain competencies with what they didn't have before. Because also, if you take into account that the, that the environment is changing that fast, are, will you be able to every time buy from the external market? And then what do you do? Therefore, instead maybe of this, I would just put the point of the agility. Because on what we touched, it's changing. Do I now hire a new person? Yes, no. How fast you can turn from left to right? How fast you can make the turn in your business model? How fast you can frame your organization? How fast you can build up the skills that will support you in doing this? the competencies that are needed. What is important ingredient in this making your company agile and not misusing this word, really the company agility to do what I would say means that the ability that you change and you adapt to the new environment. You have to always keep an eye on the business insights because this is what drives your value what your customers want, which type of services they are searching for, how do you provide these services, how do you earn money from this. You have to work on the collaboration. You are not having a single silo in your organization that can support you in doing this. And more and more, IT is not the department that is separated from all the others, but you should think of planting and IT knowledgeable people into business departments. Why? Because nowadays none of your business ideas can be done without the IT or vast majority of those. This is why the collaboration and completely thinking on how to remove the silos, how to create certain liquidity in the organization, how you can succeed with this. Adoption and adaption. There is a quite decent book on, on this, which I can share then afterwards for the ones who are um, wanting to, to understand this part better. What does it mean when the agility is very much impacting you and you need to adapt? Today here, tomorrow on, this, on the other side, how do you prepare your organization to do this in the same way? How do you make yourself aware of changing the approach? Luckily, banking is still not changing that fast that you are forced to do. But some other industries are very much impacted with this type of very fast changes. What you need to have is a digital dexterity. And this is something what, just as an example, if you have 256 different programming languages and 43 million of software programmers in the world. 
try to find the right mixture of different diversity that can support you in finding completely different ideas. Because the more diversity you can get, the more different directions you may take into what do you want to do, how do you want to frame. This is why when you are doing the change, you need to have the mindset diversity. <coughs> because mindset diversity will support your adoption, will support your collaboration, and will support your digital dexterity. So the real client at the first place is your employee, at least. You, you can't do anything of this before you, if you don't consider your own employees, then you can go for a customer. Because on your own, the CIO or anybody else cannot do anything. And on your teammates, rather than putting everything on the hiring, and I'm not saying here that we should not hire, yes, because you need to renew your energy. But you need to work more with your own employees in order to be able to do this, all of this. If you implant a new person in, it will not immediately be agile to do this. So still you need to work on this. Still you need to find the right mixture of competencies that has to be embedded. So it's a work with your own employees in order to do more than buying a technology in order to support you. Because with technology you can miss and the failure is fine but also in order to have failure as a learning point, you need to have a mindset diversity if you will fail once and twice and people will start less collaborate, but accuse each other and the adoption of the changes will not be there. You missed the point. So more than ever, it's related to people management and changing this in a completely different way. Making decisions is something what relates to a fear and what we discussed before. We fear to, to step in the car. We fear to make a decision. And especially when you have an unknown outcome, this is where you will not most probably do. But making a decision on a limited number of information that you have, this also brings you back to people management. If you empower your people to make decisions, they will do. If they fail, give them an opportunity to learn out of this and to move on. But important thing is you enlarge your possibilities because they've learned something. And what I consider very much important is that competencies are much more important than the skills. And whatever you see here is a competency, not a skill. You cannot say that somebody who is very much business driven that this is, that this is a skill. This is a competency, thinking in a customer value manner. You cannot say that the collaboration is a skill. It's a competency to coexist with other people, to listen to other people's opinion, to create people who are not um, T-shaped competencies, meaning I have a competency and it's covering this and this, but I have competencies which can go in all different directions. This is the enlarging the capability to fit for the future. There are certain points which I would just put on the culture of innovation and why I find this important. If you don't understand the culture, you can put all the efforts in your strategy, but you can also fail. These are certain points, unfortunately a bit not fitting. Mm that are essence to certain points of the cul bringing culture of innovation, not innovation itself. Innovation is an outcome of your culture. 
And as we discussed at the very beginning, you don't need to buy the most innovative fintech. You need, don't need to buy the most uh, innovative technology in order to be innovative. It goes in a completely different directions, which are always tailor-made for the single organization. It should be tailor-made for single existence in your organization. Try to tailor make your capabilities in order to fit for the future. There is no one size fits all. And it will not be. Therefore, building up, and this is really building up your capabilities to do innovation based on the culture, adapting your organization for the ag agility, and covering this with the umbrella of the digital transformation is what you can do. I would stop it here. Now, if there are some questions, let's continue with the questions. Right, before, before going into the question and answers, thank you for elaborating on all this. <laughs> You're a very challenging audience. <laughs> and there we are. Now it's time for questions. So, may I hand over the microphone? To you? Okay. Um, actually, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about the blockchain. So, I just would like to know how do you see the disruptive role of the blockchain for the financial industry? So, where do you see this whole trend going and how that will or might affect uh, the banking industry? Um, one example which is related um, very much to the collection of the data on the customer. Where, for instance, if you want to know the, the, the customer history, the customer um, pay, repayment capabilities where he or she lives, you are relying on a certain set of data that either you already have or you buy it from somebody else or you insert. And it's very hard to collect the data. While having a blockchain, you can, for example, you are searching for a, a loan, mortgage loan, and you have to collect the information on the, the residence, on the square meters, on the position. And you have to check whether it's valid. Usually you have to pay also for certain kind of assessment. While implementing a blockchain that collects all the information that are essential for this, in the right sources, and to some extent also compares the quality of the data in different sources and brings you this back. Usually very, very fast reaction time on the technology that is currently available. So you speed up your decision-making process, you have a better quality of the data based on which you are doing your decision, you reduce your efforts on certain data collections. Did I? Yes, partially, but... For instance, on the, general, on the general ledger, I don't know how much you are familiar with the general ledgers. Consolidation on the general ledger is a hell of a job. I don't know if somebody did it. All right, another question here. Um, you were talking about uh, throwing IT people into business units to have this end-to-end -end delivery responsibility, however you will put it. Um, what is Bank Austria doing to, to support this uh, challenge of agility and uh, fast moving into direction or jumping on the roller coaster or not? We were creating certain, um, I, I would not dare to call them agile teams because we are not there not at least to what I tend to, to take as a target on the Agile, but putting already in the design phase, and this is the most important one, putting in a design phase all the necessary knowledge together, really together, empowering them to decide, not that the power of decision is business and then IT, so we tell you what to do, but that this is a cross-functional team that is designing and being responsible for the outcome. This is what we did in order to pilot. This is what we are continuing to doing further on. So creating cross-functional teams that are responsible for the delivery 
of a certain product or a certain service or something that we are bringing up as a newcomer. So not agile, but the cross-functional. Agile, I think that is a challenge of the whole organization then that has to change. And it's related to the cultural aspect that not, does not change overnight. So there's a question up here. Um, on the previous slide, you mentioned data analytics and data science as a core field of a CIO. Um, is there a clear strategy towards um, data analytics in terms of use cases that you're working on or organizational trends or integration of data scientists, whether you put them into IT or the business uh, units? Uh, what uh, I can tell you on this is that um, up to now, we were mainly relying on the data analytics either in the environment of the CDO, which is more or less then related to, uh, related to certain kind of reporting, more than the real exploration of the value of the data. Now, exploration on the data, usually what banks do is in the CRM. But I don't find this way fully fitting. And uh, when it comes to data scientists, is something what I see existing in the CIO, but very much interacting with business. Because you cannot also put into every single business line one data scientist. The overall data analytics should be covered not related to the specific business unit. Um, Finding a one on the market is not very easy. Therefore, we are going for the approach internal, building up the skills. We are not there, we are on the way. I do have a question. <laughs> um, when you look at technology, you can look at two things. Uh, so there's uh, the solution space on the one hand side, and um, much of the tools, systems, and approaches that are available are on the solution side. Uh, I wonder about the problem side. Um, that means uh, understanding which specific challenges customers face. Um, that would, is what I assume uh, when you think a company uh, in a silo way, uh, that this is very much knowledge that is on the, on the business unit side. Um, so much of the, the uh, let's say, directions uh, that you mentioned Move are actually pointing towards the direction of breaking up uh, this uh, fragmentation uh, of knowledge. Um, what are insights and understandings of customer problems that emerge from this and uh, which opportunities um, does this bring? So what are like the, the little success stories that you can tell inside the company to get people more engaged and excited with these, uh, with these um, let's say, sparks that you, that you try to thread? Um, what I can, I mean, it's not a huge um, fuss, but one example where, where we had certain difficulties on the channel um, and uh, it was, as it is organizational defined, business interacting with the customer and trying to define how the solution can, can work. And uh, they were not involving IT. And basically, they were trying to find a way how to cope with this. And in one moment in time, they said to IT, it's an incident, we don't know how to manage. It was not. But at that moment, what was a good point is that the person with the IT background and the understanding said, there is a very simple way how you can fix it. Then also on the market, there is something what is easy to integrate if you want to even upscale and build it up on a more valuable level. So this is the diversity of the knowledge that you can bring and integrating more either people from IT supporting your business or allowing business to integrate more with IT and build up their own IT capabilities is something what can be a very good input for the future. Because there is no business without the IT anymore. But not building IT experts in the business, because it's also not the most efficient way, but creating the environment of the cross-functional. 
which then gives you a bigger basis of the people who understand business or IT and vice versa. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually very interested about uh, to hear about regulations because you said that uh, always uh, or actually often it's a sort of constraint. Uh, but let's say from my perspective with uh, PSD2 we are now saying basically the opposite that basically regulation is strong for new innovation you you explained actually very well uh, how you approach innovations and innovative solutions uh, and I'm interested to know how according to PSD2 you are let's say approaching integrating uh, new services thank you um. On the regulation, PSD2 is a good example because it gives you the opportunity to install a technological uh, solution that goes above your legacy and that besides fitting for the regulation purposes can also give you additional business opportunities. So installing an open hybrid platform which communicates via APIs it can communicate with whomever you wish for. This is what not covers only the regulation, but opens up a possibility for further business opportunities. Business opportunities now are being defined but by, our, by our different teams on what are exact business opportunities that we would like to take. Because now there will be a lot of players who would love to participate in this. Once you open up a possibility, there will be a lot of different players on the market that would like to participate. So technology is there to support. Hmm? You don't know. What? On? Uh, for instance, uh, we'll the part in which kind of direction. Uh, I cannot. Yeah. What, what I can advise? I mean, one of the examples, Gartner is doing a very good job when it comes to Magic Quadrant. And there you can get all the providers which are most mature, most price convenient, most business oriented, most. All right, I want to close with one final question. Let's imagine I was a bachelor or a master student and uh, I would like to take a roller coaster ride with Tina. What would you advise or which kind of opportunities are there for students? Um, in order to be very precise on uh, what are our missing competencies or where we would like to uh, embrace a bit more changes, we're working a lot uh, also in the direction of the cybersecurity, which unfortunately we did not touch up now. But it's something what, uh, with all the opportunities, is, it brings a lot of threats. And cybersecurity is not only about IT. Uh, cybersecurity is really something where a mindset and a digit mindset diversity and a digital dexterity can and will support us a lot. So this is the area where we will have even more opportunities than before. Then in order to lead the digital transformation, as we discussed, to support it from bottom up on the process management, whereas the skills which we, we showed or the, the competencies which were embedded on the, um, on the organizational agility. So business insight, digital at least, and the mindset of assessing different technological solution. Collaboration, quite common but yet we don't find it always that all of our teammates are, are that easy to collaborate, to break the silo, to work on this and to adapt and to adopt certain changes very fast. So adaptation to changes and being able to absorb changes and act on this is a type of competencies that we are searching for. So in the cyber security, ICT security, so to be bit more concrete and on the process management, this is where very concretely with certain type of, 
of uh, competencies we would be very happy to interact with. All right, so be invited. Thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.